Good morning, Covenant Church. Good to be in the house of the Lord. The presence of the Lord is here. Amen. Amen. Welcome to our North Campus and everyone watching online this morning. Thank you so much. So good to see our Colleyville people here. And now we are back to being one church in this location. And it's a it's a God decision, and it was just a decision to be obedient, and we are grateful for all the things we already see God orchestrating on our behalf um, together. When I went to Colleyville a few weeks ago to talk to them about the change, it's like the Holy Spirit just showed me the example of taking stem cells. You know, stem cells are like the original cells with the blueprint that is given to us at birth. So a lot of stem cells are contained in the cord blood. So some people will save cord blood for and bank it for their children. So if their kids grow up and they have an autoimmune or anything, the stem cells can help being infused back into the body, help heal the body. And I just saw Colleyville and their strength and the leadership and their dedication as the Holy Spirit taking stem cells and infusing that DNA, that pure DNA back into Covenant Church in a way that is just going to invigorate us and take us to the next level. So we are grateful to you. We are grateful and we are excited about what God is going to do. We can't see around the corner. All we're called to do is just obey. And that's what we're doing. But we do see the goodness of God. We see how he works all things together for our good. Amen. And uh, I'm excited about Pastors Paul and Stephanie as well, and uh, leading us in discipleship. And, and today's word is really, it, it carries the seed of the passion that I have for discipleship and the history I have with this church and the discipleship I have received from a young age all the way up from Sunday school, we used to call it. Uh, now it's called Children's Church, but uh, from Sunday school all the way up. But we've, we've had a lot of things going on here at Covenant Church, uh, the moves, the transitions, and uh, we moved into a house uh, around September 8th. We spent one night in our new house, and then we married off our youngest son, uh, Tate. He's one of the twins. We had a beautiful time. This is a picture of their wedding three weeks ago. And then yesterday, we married one of our other sons, Stason. He's the second from the oldest right here on this campus. They were married yesterday. So we're excited about the two beautiful daughters God has given us. What a blessing. And um, I'm excited about grandchildren. So I'm ready for people to get the show on the road. I'm like, I, you don't need to wait. You've got me. We, we're going to babysit. You know, we'll help take care of them. And uh, the, the longer you wait, the less years I have with them. So I'm ready for you to, to get going. Uh, we'll hope God speaks that to him too. So you just have to pray. But, um, but today I want to um, launch this series, God Breathes about the inspired word of God. And that, that term, God breathes, comes from 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 that says all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So that's where we get this, this verse. Many other translations we'll talk about in a moment uh, use the term, all scripture is inspired by God. We're going to talk about that word inspired because the authors were inspired, but the word was inspired is the point. The word is what's full of the breath of God. It comes directly from God. So the word of God was spoken. We know God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. He had one-on-one -on -one conversations, but the beginning of scripture as we know it comes with the origin from Moses in at Mount Sinai. He is set apart and God reveals to him. He says, show me your glory. And God shows him our story. And our story began with Moses writing everything God revealed to him from Genesis on down. So the first five books in the Bible are called the Torah or the Pentateuch. 
So what's interesting about the Torah is in Hebrew, they read, we read from left to right, and they read from right to left. So this book opens the opposite way than we would because of the direction of how they read. So the Torah is in Hebrew, it means, it's from Hebrew, it means instruction, doctrine, law, or to show or direct. It's also called the Pentateuch. So when people talk about the Pentateuch, penta means five. So from Greek, it means in Middle English, it's translated from penta and, and, and tukos, which means to implement. So the first five tools God gave us is the Pentateuch. So the first five books of the Bible are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those five books, Moses ironically authored by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So he was simply the lungs God used to breathe the word. In fact, what's beautiful about this testimony with Moses is that Moses complained to God and said, I'm not a good communicator. I have a communication problem. I stutter when I speak. So please send my brother Aaron. How many of us have ever prayed that prayer? Hear my God, send someone else. You're asking me to do that. That's the error of my weakness. I don't want to do it. I don't want to be set up for failure. And God said, okay, when it comes to verbal communication to Pharaoh, I will allow Aaron to speak for you. So at the tent of meeting, you and your brother can converse. You will download to Aaron everything I tell you, and he's not to add to it. He's only to say exactly what you say. So Aaron would repeat to the people, this is the word of God. But when it came to writing it, God didn't want a middleman. He said, I'm already using you. You're going to write it. So Moses, the person who was most worried about his communication ability, became the greatest, most famous communicator of all time. Because the Bible is still the most best-selling book of all time. Every year, it is the most best-selling book. In fact, last year, more than 20 million books of the Bible were sold in the US alone, more than 60 million around the world. The Bible is also the most stolen book in the world. Isn't that interesting? Like if you're gonna steal a Bible, I guess you need it more than the person you stole it from. But it's, it, it is one of those things that I guess they track through hospitals and, and, and Gideon Bibles and that kind of thing. But so the word of God is inspired. This is something that you must choose to believe, that God used 40 individuals from three different continents over a span of 1,500 years to write his word. That's quite a miracle in and of itself because shepherds, kings, priests, scholars, fishermen, and prophets were the authors of the word of God. They were the scribes, that's a better way to put it, because they actually, it wasn't their ideas, it wasn't their thoughts, they simply were translating the word that God gave them. God moved and guided the authors of the Bible as they wrote. At the same time, this process allowed the writers to use their own styles, which I think is really interesting, and their personalities come out. The Bible is unique among all other books in the world because its message is unified throughout 66 books. Think about that. I mean, to get 40 different authors in three different languages over three different continents over 1,500 years to all confirm the same message. The unification of that is profound because they, they didn't know what the other person was writing. Think about being separated, a world apart. They didn't have Google, they didn't have the cloud, they didn't have Wi-Fi, they didn't have a way to communicate. All they did was hear from the Spirit and God doesn't disagree with himself, amen? So the Word of God is congruent. It all comes together, it adds up. It's over a thousand chapters and more than 600,000 words. I, I'll get into what version I like in a moment, but one of the reasons I love the version I love is because it's around 600,000 words. Now, you can get a book like the New King James Version, and it will have, you know, many, many more, more than 600,000 because it uses also the Amplified. There'll be 10 adjectives in the Amplified. 
the Word of God. The Word of God has five genres. Now, we know when we talk about movies or we talk about music, we know what a genre is, right? But when the Word of God is divided, I want you to see how these genres fit. So the, the lion's share of the Word of God fits under historical narrative. So there is history there. Genesis, the first five books of the Bible fit under that. And we have Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel. That's all going out of the, out of the wilderness into Egypt. Uh, out of Egypt, into the wilderness, and into the promised land. Then we've got Kings. Chronicles takes us through the obvious, the Chronicles of Kings. And then Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Jonah, and then part of the New Testament. You get Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. The epistles then are all New Testament books, and they are letters to the early churches. So we call those epistles, but for instance, the Romans, Romans, the book of Romans is a letter to the Romans living in Rome. You'll find the cities contained in many of these words. So Galatia is the Galatians. Ephesus is the book of Ephesians, was written to the believers in Ephesus, and Philippi. Um, so we got that all the way down, all right? So you'll see those. Then the prophets are also broken in. If you go to Bible school, they're broken into major and minor prophets, and we'll get into that in the weeks to come. But right now, it's just listed in the five genres as the prophets. And then we have, again, the first five books of the Bible, which is the Pentateuch I mentioned, and wisdom and literature is the fifth category. This is where we find um, Song of Songs, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, Psalms, and Job. That is the genres of the Bible. Anybody learning anything this morning? It's helpful, right? So the word of God is eternal. This is a truth that we also must adopt and believe. Isaiah 48 says, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of God endures forever. The word, even though we had historical narrative, the Bible is not just a book about the past. It is also a book about the present and the future. This is really important for us to understand because the breath of God is the same breath that brought you to life. So when God spoke you into existence, he breathed your name, he breathed your God name into existence in the womb of your mother and brought you to life. That same breath that brought you to life is the same breath that lives between these pages. It is your DNA. It is what you are made of. It is your same spiritual blueprint. So this is why it's so important for us to understand when we read something, we might be reading all the begats. You know, the begats are um, Jacob begat, and you go through the whole list, and you can get blessed even in the begats. But there are boring parts of the historical narrative that we can get lost on, that we think it's just about the history. When you really begin to study, you see the patterns of the nature of God. You learn something from everything. There is future contained in the historical narrative. The Bible, the Word of God, is eternal. The divine origin of the Bible is demonstrated through its frequent use of prophecy of all the holy books in the world. Only the Bible contains accurate, predictive prophecy because only the God of the Bible knows the future and has the power to bring it to pass. <laughs> Unique among all books ever written, the Bible accurately foretells specific events in detail many years, sometimes centuries before they occur. Now, this is what's really interesting. Approximately 2,500 prophecies appear in the pages of the Bible, about 2,000 of which have already been fulfilled by the letter, to the letter, no errors. This is pretty powerful. This can be documented. You can read about this. You can study this. 2,000 prophecies. That leaves us 500 left. So what I want to go over with the 2,000 that's really interesting is since the probability for any one of these prophecies having been fulfilled by chance averages less than 1 in 10, so that's pretty conservative, since the prophecies are for the most part independent of one another, the odds for all of these prophecies having been fulfilled by chance without error is less than 1 
in 10 to the 2,000th. What that means is it's a one with 2,000 zeros after that. Isn't that incredible? Between services, Pastor Brian and I were talking in the back and, and he explained that the eight prophecies, the Messianic prophecies that Jesus fulfilled that were very specific about him, some of which he could not control, like the virgin conception, right? And even his resurrection, his death and resurrection, um, those happening to one individual, the odds for that that were being explained is that if the whole state of Texas was covered over with silver dollars, stacked up two feet high, and you picked one of those out, that's the chances that one man in history could fulfill all eight of the prophecies that were spoken about him. That, that's hard to comprehend. But God knows the end from the beginning. He's written the book of time. He says in Isaiah 46, nine through 12, this is one of my favorite concepts from God describing himself. He says, remember the former things, those of long ago, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning from ancient times what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. From the east I summon a bird of prey. From the far off land a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. God is a God of his word. He keeps his word, he knows his word, and FYI, the enemy knows his word too. He even used the word of God, what was written to argue with Jesus. So he knows the word. So it's his job to twist it in order to get you to believe that God is not for you. He wants to use the word of God as a weapon against you. This is why it's so important for you to fall in love with the word of God. You know, this is my Bible, this is the first it's not the Bible I use today. It is King James, I believe. Yes, it's King James. So this is the King's English. This is the old one. This was my first childhood Bible. And um, in the front, I have an award certificate similar to the Cove Cash that the kids get now. This is what I got years ago. And um, I honored my Sunday school teachers who were here in the first service because they awarded this to me. I had my little bookmark. I have three of them in here, and uh, they have all the books of the Bible so I could memorize the books of the Bible. I also have my birth certificate and adoption papers for my cabbage patch, Marcel Archibald. I took that really seriously. That adoption went, you know, it went, because usually you have a list where you put marriages and all that in your Bible. I had the adoption papers because I was serious about that cabbage patch. I know he's probably salty with me right now because he's been in a bin for God knows how long, but I do still have him. The front of this Bible, though, it says, presented to Amy Hayes by her teachers, Debbie Rose and Barbara Johnson, October 14th, 1979. I was born in 1974, so I was five years old for memorizing 13 memory verses in two Sundays and because we love you. Now, I, 13 memory verses for a five-year-old that had trouble reading is quite miraculous. I, they stopped teaching phonics when it was time for me to learn how to read and it was memorization and I struggled with that. So my mother is the one who taught me how to read and my mother also, you know, I talk about my dad a lot. I talk about my dad and I sort of you know, in being in the same headspace, we are very connected, you know, in intellectually. But my mother and I have the same heart. My mother has been my most faithful and um, most precious teacher all my life. So even though I have some of the the same thought processes as my father, my mother is the one who taught me uh, a love for the Word of God. So when it was time and a challenge was given to memorize memory verses, my Sunday school teachers didn't go home with me. My mother made sure that I could learn those. And I remember the first one that I was supposed to learn is 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. That was the first one that I was supposed to learn. And I remember my mother, you know, just so sweetly, she said, listen, this is how we're gonna remember it. Because my mother has always told this story that her father told that we were direct descendants of Kwana Parker. My mother's main name is Parker. So my mother said, listen, what goes with this verse is you're gonna pretend that you are a squaw on a path and you have a bow and an arrow and you are navigating this path and there's an enemy around you. So I remember every time I would begin to start trying to memorize this, I would say, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. My mother acted the whole thing out to help me memorize so that in one week I was able to learn 13 verses and quote them the next Sunday. And I have loved the word of God because it sticks. This is what I want to to say to you, especially if you have anyone that deals with a learning difference. The word of God is, no matter what language it's translated, and this is what's so beautiful, it retains its poetic nature. It's easy to memorize. Sometimes it's not easy to understand but it's easy to read and to memorize. And I would encourage you at home to be sure. Do you remember in the revival this week, I really challenged all of us to ask the question, what makes us different from the rest of the people in the world? As Christians, as believers, how could we be seen and known as a believer? And the point of Passover that I shared with you on Sunday night, the breaking point where Egyptians and Israelites were definitively split and divided came at the place of Passover where they were sitting at their own tables around their own home. That's where the real separation between the wheat and the tares comes. What do you do between Sundays? That's what I'm asking. What do you do with your children? My parents did not delegate the learning of the Bible to just Sundays with the Sunday school teacher. My mother made sure during the week, we didn't waste any time in the car. Every time I'd be in the car with my mother, she would take it as an opportunity to talk to me about what I thought God was saying to me. What was I praying about? What have I memorized? What have I learned this week? I encourage you to do that with your children, with your grandchildren. It's never too late. Do it yourself. Begin to memorize a scripture. Take one memory verse this week. How about we use that one? We could do trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. That's a great verse. That works for any time. The word of God is eternal. We don't just look up a scripture because we have a problem. See, I think this is what's connected to us is what's really different about Hebrews and Jews is Hebrew school, when kids first go to Hebrew school, the first thing they do the first day they go to learn Hebrew is they give them a slate. It's like a little chalkboard and they've been doing it for centuries. So in the time of Jesus, they would, he would have had a little slate with a little piece of chalk rock that he could have written his his symbols in Hebrew and in Greek and in Aramaic is what he, which is what he spoke. So he would have been writing on that. But the very first day they go to Hebrew school, they cover the slate with honey. So the first job for the kids when they show up is to lick all the honey off of the slate. The reason for this is because then the Torah is always connected to the fact that the word of God is sweet. The word of God is nourishing. See, what what happens in our day today, and I pray that this does bring a holy conviction. There is no condemnation, but conviction is the idea and of the idea that you and I don't just go to the word of God and look for a scripture when we're hurting, when we're sick, when we're needy. Because then that means we're just looking at the word of God as medicine. And medicine it is, but it is also nutrition. We should look at it and say, I'm hungry for something. I need a word every day. Years ago, when I was a teenager, I remember I was, we lived in Carrollton, just down the street on North Ridge, and I had a big mirror in my bathroom. And man, I was, this was the 
you know, I have natural curly hair, but on top of that, I decided to get a perm. I don't know why. So I looked like, you know, a, I don't know, Rosanna, Rosanna Dana or something like that. My hair was out to here, and, you know, we had that hairspray at that time where you'd spray the bangs straight up and everything. So I was working on my outward appearance, worried about how I looked for school. And I remember hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit, that still small voice that said, Amy, I wonder what your spirit looks like. Have you, have you spent as much time preparing your spirit as you have your outward appearance? Because when the enemy looks at you, Amy, all he sees is the condition of your spirit. You want to go to battle with him? Are you battle ready? And I remember at that time, Ethiopia was on everyone's mind. There was a famine and there was starving going on. And I remember seeing, you know, on television, the commercials, and I had literally never seen someone just walk like a walking skeleton. Do y'all remember back then when they were showing the famine that was going on and we were sending money and we were sending mission. And I remember thinking, how can these people even walk? How can they even move? It looks as though they have no muscle, no fat. They're just a skeleton. And I remember when that question was posed to me by the Holy Spirit, Amy, what does your spirit look like? That's what I pictured. Because if, it, if my spirit was only growing when I was consuming the word of God, then I was dying on the inside. I was feeding the outside. I was feeding my soul. I was feeding my emotions. But I wasn't intentionally feeding my spirit because it's easy to neglect something you can't see. It's easy to put that on the back burner and say, that's not gonna really make a difference today. You know, that's, that's why we don't start, you know, eating healthy. It's because we think, man, I could have this Krispy Kreme donut and it's not gonna make any difference. Or I could have this really healthy meal right now and it's not gonna make any difference. Tomorrow, I'm not gonna be able to zip up those jeans because I eat one healthy meal. But it's saying that to ourselves every day that would make a difference if we did just make that switch every single day, then eventually that we'd be healthy. But when we think it doesn't make a difference right now, it's not gonna make any physical impact. Nobody's gonna be able to tell that I've made a good decision. Then we don't make the good decision. And this is about the word of God. The, the, the decision that has to be made is I didn't just fall in love with the word of God, just like falling off a log. I was a child when I began to take in the word of God and I recognized the difference in my strength, in my resilience, in my tenacity, when I had a word to hold on to. I'm speaking to somebody in this room today because we talk about the prodigal son and in that story that Jesus told, he's in a pig pen, he's covered with filth. Sure, he's been sinning, but I want to just push that aside for a minute. And I just want to say, let's look at the pig pen as our thoughts, our thought life. The Bible says what happened to change his story is that he simply came to himself and said to himself, in my father's house, I'll have a bath. I'll have a new robe. There are people under the sound of my voice right now where you are waiting for someone to show up and rescue you. And the father in this parable, Jesus told, the father didn't go hunting. He didn't hire a private investigator go looking for his son. That is not his way. He waits until we come to ourselves and say, I have surrounded myself with the wrong ideas. I have come into alignment with the wrong thoughts, with the wrong people. Because when you... I, I know this from personal experience. When you keep trying to save someone who doesn't want it for themselves, all the efforts are wasted. All the effort, until somebody comes to themselves and says, I am made from greater DNA than this. I am meant for more than this. And say it to themselves. I can't go home with you and save you from your self-talk. You have to do that for yourself. 
You have to pull yourself up and say, this is not what God meant for me. He meant bigger things for me. Where's my Bible? Do I even know where it is? Let me go dust it off. Open this thing up and see what God has to say to me today. I don't have to feel it. This is what I want you to understand. My dad, he taught this for years. It is better to act your way into the right feeling than depend on trying to feel your way into the right action. You will never, your feelings are not Lord. Your feelings should not govern your decisions. You should, your spirit, putting your spirit, this is what I call it, putting your spirit uppermost. So now every morning when I get ready, I look in the mirror. There isn't a morning that goes by that I don't get ready and prepare my outward appearance that I don't first look at my spirit and say, Amy, what condition are you in right now? Today, I'm not, I don't feel sorry for myself, but I stand in front of you physically exhausted. I've, I've pulled off two weddings in three weeks. I've moved from Florida. I've, I had three different storage places to bring furniture to, to one house. I, coming from all different directions, my stuff was everywhere. We got moved over. I'm tired. I'm physically tired. This would have been a great Sunday to have somebody else speak. My feet hurt. Everything hurts. But when I looked in the mirror this morning, I see a spirit that's prepared. Whether I show up or not is not dependent on what's going on physically. It's what's going on spiritually. What's my assignment? What have I been put here for? Nothing else takes precedent from that. And this is the thing, is that we've had this saying that's famous where, you know, the enemy, we say to him, not today, Satan. I have this motto and this idea that I want Satan to look at me and say, not today, Amy. I don't have what it takes to go up against you today. Not today, because if he can see my spirit, he knows whether or not I'm equipped. And I would much rather be intimidating in the spirit so that he goes, I don't even wanna mess with her. I don't wanna go there today. I don't have time for this. The hour is nearing. I don't have enough time to mess with her. See, this is the thing is we can come to church and we can wrap ourselves up in pretty clothes and we can tuck a Bible under our arm and we can look really super spiritual, but the enemy knows exactly what your spirit looks like because your spirit is the thing that will live forever. Isn't it time that you start preparing for forever? Isn't it time that you begin every day by being renewed? You know, the word of God is living and active. It is the breath of God. And the breath of God is what created you. That's what's so beautiful about the verse that says, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That comes by hearing the word of God. And hearing comes by hearing the word of God. How do you hear the word of God? If you're, if you're only hearing the word of God on Sundays or when you decide to YouTube, that's not enough nutrition for your spirit, for the, for the warfare that you live under right now. You should be hearing the word of God every day. How do you do this? See, when my, my prayer life, my power, my potency, my authority, all of that shifted when I went from reading the Bible like this to declaring it out loud. Because when I read the Bible out loud, see, reading it just silently for myself, it can transform me. It can change me from the inside out. But the thing that gives me authority over the atmosphere is declaring the word of God. The atmosphere in your home won't change just because you think the Bible. It changes when you open your mouth and declare the word of God. It's time for us to take authority you know, the word believe, we, I think we get this idea, and, and, and this is what's so infuriating about Webster's. Somebody bought me a Webster's Dictionary from 1887. It's this thick. It's the thickest book I have. Man, it weighs probably about 12 pounds. It's like carrying around a stump of a tree, basically. 
And when you look at the definitions then of certain words, the definition now does not match at all. Because Webster's, they continually change the definition based on how it's used. So original meaning, original intent is lost. But the word believe, we use it now as I think or I'm convinced of something. That's how we use it. This is what I believe. But you know the word believe actually means to thoroughly live. That's what it means. So do you believe the word of God? You don't have to feel it. You don't have to be crazy, craving the word of God. I want you to, and you will get to that place, but you don't start there. You start by making the decision to say, this is good for me. This will actually recreate me every day because if the word of God, if the breath of God is what was spoken and spoke you into existence, then every time you take in the word of God, it is bringing new life to you. You talk about the fountain of youth, read the word of God. The word of God will take you back. It's just like stem cells being infused back into you again. New life, new ideas. It continually challenges us. The word of God is eternal. It is not just historical. It is giving us a picture of the future. The word of God is also pure. This is something we must believe. You know, a common objection to the accuracy of the Bible is people will say, isn't the Bible just a copy of a copy of a copy? Well, that is true. It is a copy, but it's not a copy of a copy of a copy. The scribes who copied scripture took great care in their work. In fact, accuracy was ensured by a number of safeguards, including, think about when they had it like this and their symbols, they would count the symbols across the line. It was double checked multiple times. So they counted the letters in a line and on a page and minor variations exist between certain manuscripts of the Bible. But thanks to the abundance of early texts that we have and fragments, we can ascertain the original wording in nearly every case. The Bible is not what we expect to find though from a holy book. If you were to pick up the Quran or the Book of Mormon, there are other holy books, they're considered holy, that praise the, pe the people therein. That's what separates this book from all other holy books, is that the scribes for this book, people like the Apostle Paul or like King David, they did not glorify themselves and their story. All other holy books whitewash their heroes. They're flawless. You can tell then that there's a motivation attached to the writing of those books. This book lays bare transparently the struggle of humanity. It is honest about the heroes of the faith. And that in itself is a beautiful way to guarantee the accuracy. Why would someone write a story that doesn't favor them unless it was true? There's no motivation there to make yourself look bad except to teach others this is the right way. Walk in it. I want to show you the canonization of Scripture. So in Jesus' time, at the, around the birth of Jesus, there was what we call the silent years. There was 400 years where nothing was written in terms of Scripture. So the, the canon of the Old Testament was sealed. It was finished. It was complete 400 years before the New Testament began. When the New Testament books were written, this was the criteria for canonization. Now, the Catholic uh, Bible has 73 books. The Protestant Bible has 66. There is a reason the Protestant Bible was canonized with 66 and not 73, because those additional books, like the book of Thomas, or even the book of Mary Magdalene, those have been proven to not have been written by those individuals, and there are, there are fallacies involved. So in order for it to be canonized, that means to be sealed as pure. The origins were all researched. So this gives us the idea, these four things were the criteria for the canonization of the New Testament. It had to be affirmed by the local early church. It reflects the power of God to comfort, instruct, correct, and convict. It is, above all, consistent with the rest of Scripture. 
and the apostles approved it. So it was either written by an apostle or by a close associate. And the authorship wasn't so important. We know that there are books that we think that Paul wrote, like Hebrews, but then we also think, well, that could have been his assistant or his associate. I don't think taking credit for it was the goal uh, in the New Testament. So this is what gives us the stamp of uh, purity. You know, I order Uber Eats a lot. And when I get a Starbucks that doesn't have the little seal on the mouth of it, I'm a little concerned. You want it to be sealed. You want to know nobody else has taken a sip out of it before they brought it to you, right? So this is the guarantee that the Bible, it has been thoroughly researched. And these we know are safe to say this is the inspired word of God. Isaiah 40, 22 Um, gives us a really great context about the accuracy of the word of God, even when science did not match up. So, you know, years ago, they believed that the earth was flat. Columbus, you know, the story, he wanted to prove that the earth was round. But in Isaiah 40, 22, this book was found, the Dead Sea Scroll, the complete book of Isaiah was found in, in Qumran, a place where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, the whole book of Isaiah was there and it was placed there more than a century before the birth of Jesus. And this book was written even before that. And it says here that God sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and its people are like grasshoppers. Another fun scientific fact found in the Bible is in reference to space. Space was not an idea. The universe was not an idea at all until recent, relative recent history. But in in the Bible, there's a reference found in Job 26, 7. Job is the oldest book in the Bible. It was written before any other book of the Bible, even though its history didn't happen before Genesis, obviously. It's the oldest manuscript, and it dates back to approximately the 6th century B.C., And this verse says, he spreads out the northern skies over empty space. He suspends the earth over nothing. At a time when this writing and for centuries afterward, many didn't believe in a free floating earth. In fact, the Bible also supports that the earth revolves around the sun, which was not discovered until millennia later. The accuracy of the Bible is only going to be continually undergirded by discovery. There are thousands of discoveries in Egypt, in Asia Minor, in Greece, and in also in Jerusalem and in, in greater Israel that have been found because of the accuracy of the historical account of the word of God. It leads people to the correct location to look for things. I wanna take you now to translations before we close this service. How many of you brought your paper Bible today? I saw some throughout the room this morning. I'm gonna encourage you to do that. Like I said at the revival service, you know, you can't go from reading scripture to bidding on a t-shirt on eBay. This is a clean plate to eat off of. And I think it's important to have some things. There's very few things in the world today that are pure. And our phone or our iPad, it mixes so many other things together. Maybe even you have done things that you wish you hadn't, that you've had to repent for on your phone. I, the, the moments that I have really had those encounters with God have not happened when I'm reading it off my phone. They've happened when this is laying on my, on my lap. I think there's just a purity to intentionality. I can't get distracted by a text message. So when we come to church, I know we have phones that go off and we have babies that cry and there's distractions, but we want to make an effort to have as pure of an experience with the encounter with the breath of God that we can, amen? So let's look at the translations. If you brought a paper copy of your Bible, then you can look at it and see. It's, it's usually on the, the binding of your Bible. This one is, is a King James Version, but my go-to version is NIV, and I'll explain the reason for that. So the three original languages that the Bible is translated from are Greek, Aramaic, and Hebrew. Daniel is written in the book, is written in the language of Aramaic. It's predominantly, you can see Hebrew, which is the Old Testament, and the New Testament is Greek. So when we look at what they're translated to, there is methods to that. So when I talk to you about Hebrew, and we've done this for years, we know that Hebrew is a pictorial language. 
It looks like sort of sketches or drawings on the side of a cave wall. There are pictures that can mean various different things depending on the context of what surrounds it. So there are different ways to translate the Bible. There are word-for-word translations to, to your far left. So we start with the interlinear Bible, the NASB. How many people like the Amplified Bible? That's word for word. That is many words for one word, in fact. We've got King James, New King James. We've got the ESV and the CSV is right over thought for thought. And then NIV is kind of pretty much in the middle of thought for thought. And all the way toward the other end of the scale is the paraphrase, which is the message version. There's also a Bible called the Passion that is also paraphrased. Great, those are great. They're great for life application. They're great for enjoyable reading. But when you wanna go back to original language, um, this is what I do, is I read the NIV for enjoyment. The reason I love it is because it, it doesn't lose the thought. It, its priority in translation is the heart of this message is this, which I think is the most important first. And then when something gets my attention in the heart of that message, I go and study from the Berean Study Bible. That is my favorite study Bible. That gives a lot of original Hebrew and Greek information. So 2 Timothy The verse that we're using for this, where we get the statement, God breathes. I'll give you an example for why I love NIV. Because even though it's thought for thought, it will at times, many times, especially the New Testament, use the exact translation of a word that is unique. So the words God breathed are found in the NIV version, but not in all the other versions. Most of the other versions that that transcribe 2 Timothy, all scripture is God breathed. They use the word inspired. All scripture is inspired. And the word in, in Greek is theonustos. That's the word, theonustos. So theo is God. That's where we get theology, right? Theo. Theonustos means God Inspired. It's not actually the word inspired because when it means to breathe. To inspire means to take in air for your lungs to be filled. But this is actually the word spired. So it means God blew out. This gives me a little bit different understanding than just being inspired because you and I, when we think about oh, it's inspired or it's inspiring. I saw a play and it was so inspiring. We get this idea that it's, we get chills and it made us feel good. Instead, the original meaning of this, God breathed, means that when you show up, if God is going to be expressing air upon you, is he, if he's gonna be breathing upon you, if his breath is going out, then you should be on the side of taking it in right? It's not just inspiring. It's not just, I am going to breathe in the presence of God. It is, I can't breathe unless he breathes on me. He is the oxygen. When he breathes on me, then I receive new life. You know, many times in our relationship with God, I think we think more about venting. I'm going to go before the presence of God and I'm just going to, Exhale everything I'm going through. And that is a part of your relationship with God. This is why the name Yahweh means breath because it is the sound we make when we breathe. Yahweh, Yahweh. That's where the name of God comes from, to breathe. So for you and I, our prayer is not just supposed to be the expelling of everything we're going through. God, I have all these needs. God, I need you to come through. God, I need healing. God, there's problems. Ah, it's the taking in of what the word of God does for us. It is emptying ourselves so that we can be filled again. So this is why I love the NIV. 
I use the NIV most of the time when I preach or when I speak because it does, it uses thought for thought, but it also has very specific, unique words that are the exact word in Greek. So the Bible that you and I hold in our hands is not the Catholic Bible, it is the Protestant Bible. It was produced in 1557 in Geneva, Switzerland. During the time of Bloody Mary, the older sister of Queen Elizabeth I, they're both daughters of Henry VIII, and Mary, Queen of Scots, was a different Mary, and Mary I of England was called Bloody Mary because she put to death all of the Protestant priests. She was beheading them. She was burning them at the stake because she believed that the Protestant religion was uh, of the devil. She only believed in the Holy Church and the Vatican, and so that's what she stood by. So it was a battle between her and Elizabeth, her Protestant, the Protestant princess was Queen Elizabeth I. And so all during this time, anyone who had a Protestant belief, which by the way, John Knox, Hudson Taylor, all of these men who believed that we should have the right to read the Bible were Protestant. So we've been to the room in Edinburgh. It was really fun and enjoyable, but we went to Edinburgh and sat in the room where John Knox sat across from Bloody Mary, the Queen of England, and made his case for why the Bible should be read. He said, he, he, she said she's never been more afraid of any single man. She never felt more authority. The, the, the tomb of John Knox is also in Edinburgh, and upon his his hand is resting on the tomb in this huge, beautiful marble statue is laid upon a Bible that is unlocked because his heart was for all of us to be able to read. So the Catholic religion did not believe anyone that did not have a clerical collar should be able to read the word of God, that it should be read only by priests and interpreted by priests and, and given to you, fed to you, bottle fed to the, the masses. So because they believed that we should all have the word of God, many of them fled to Geneva, Switzerland for their lives. And they created the Geneva Bible. So the Geneva Bible was very influential in the 16th century. It was the first time that it was printed on a printing press for the very first time. And one of the books from the Geneva Bible collection were actually taken on the Mayflower in 1620. Um, it was the first Bible to include annotation. It was the first Bible to include verse numbers because even though the, the Bible had uh, books, it was not broken into chapter or verse. So it was hard to find. So they, they made it easy for the average person to read. You know, years ago when we were in Scotland, um, we asked our tour guide because we were there to study the great revivals, the beginning of the Protestant movement. And there isn't everything good about the Protestant movement, but Protestant means to protest, right? So their protest was that a Bible should be in, in the household of every believer. And so we asked our tour guide, who was not a believer, by the way, um, about the oldest college or university in the world is Edinburgh University. And out of Edinburgh was started Oxford, which was started, Oxford and Cambridge were both started out of Edinburgh during the great illumination. The illumination came and went to, to start these universities as seminaries. So in case you don't know this, all of our great Ivy League schools were all originally started as seminaries to educate teachers of the word. So that when everyone would get a Bible, they would have some access to someone who could help them interpret what they were reading. We ask our tour guide, what do you think was the real tipping point? Why did the great illumination happen? Because out of the great illumination came this huge groundswell of ideas and strategies and above all innovation. The light bulb was invented because of the great illumination, ironically and beautifully. Many inventions came out of Scotland because of that. And so we're asking our atheist tour guide, funny, we had him take us on a revival tour and he was an atheist, but he was sweet, Marty McComb, that was his name. And he said, you know, the trigger for it was John Knox recognized that if everyone were going to be given a Bible, they had to be educated and had to know how to read. So public education began for everyone to be able to read so that they could read.
the word of God. That was the key to the great illumination. The illumination then was a domino effect that took place. So this is, I know I'm, I'm getting over time. I need to finish up, but this, this is amazing and beautiful. The confluence of events that took place were, was incredible because John Knox then sent out Hudson Taylor. They started Oxford University, Cambridge University, were raised up as seminaries. And um, in the 18th century, there were seven men. Um, they were known as the Cambridge Seven. One of them was a famous rugby player, and they were the creme de la creme of society. And the Holy Spirit actually... The Holy Spirit revealed himself in a dream to these young men. D.L. Moody had come over and there was revivals happening all over the UK and God revealed himself to these seven influencers. They were some of them uh, future um, uh, aristocracy. They all stood up at the commencement exercise, seven of them, and said, God has sent us to China and they're called the Cambridge Seven, and they took the word of God to China when no one was allowed in China. In fact, they all had to sleep on boats in the water so that they wouldn't be killed. During the day, they'd go minister to Chinese, and they'd get back on the boat at night so that they could survive. They spent their whole life, they gave up all their wealth, all their titles, everything, because of the great illumination. Something happens when you begin to read the word of God. Many things take place that we could never calculate. And this is the thing, is someone who does not read has no advantage over someone who cannot read. I think we forget that because we've got Bibles laying all over the place. We forget what a treasure, what a prize this is. And we never crack it open and think, what is my future here, God? And I want to encourage you that when you begin to read, if you just want to start with Genesis right now, start with Genesis 1 and 1 and begin to read the Word of God. Don't read it to say, God, I need an answer for a problem I have today. Just open the Bible and begin to read and say, God, show me yourself. You know, knowing God is going to change your worship. You can't just stand here during a worship service when you really know who you're worshiping. You can't clap and celebrate for a cowboy game and then stand here and look at it like it's a concert on Sunday morning when you really know him. Will you stand with me today? My heart swells with desire and I feel like I'm carrying the burden of the Holy Spirit right now in a way for you. I I wanna make this really clear is I, I was a kid raised in church and maybe that's not your story, but I'm no holier than you are. I've just chosen to be set apart in this way. It's the only thing that sets me apart from the rest of the world is my dedication to the Word of God. And I don't read the Bible every day. Almost, but not every day. i am be honest with you, I don't. There's days when I'll, I pray, I contemplate, I'll, I'll quote something, but I don't crack open the Bible. I don't want you to feel any condemnation, but it is living water. You need it and you don't know. You know, I got the flu one time when I was a, a child and I, I couldn't eat. And I got so sick that I had no appetite. And we were going to youth camp, I remember. And and there was a lady there with my mom, kind of like a a helper with us. And she began trying to give me different foods to get me to eat. And I was just skin and bones and I had no appetite. The thought of eating made me so sick. And I remember the lady saying to me, I know, Amy, when you look at this food, you think I can't but if you'll just eat this one grape, just, I still remember saying, just eat this one grape, and once you begin to eat something, you will get a taste for it. It will, it will create hunger. You've just gone too long without taking in no nutrition. You don't know how badly you need it. What I wanna pray over you this morning is that God would just baptize us with a hunger for His Word, a hunger and a thirst. Father, I thank You for Your children, for Your people, We are created in your image. You made us just like you. 
With your breath, you breathed your spirit into us. You called us forth out of the dust. We are made from your word. And God, I thank you right now that you are pouring out, like, like being saturated and baptized, you are pouring out a hunger and a thirst for your word, God. Father, I thank you right now for every heart, every mind to be opened. I thank you for the holy conviction that comes upon your people right now, God, for us to look in the mirror of our lives and to see our spirit and to question the condition or neglect that we have for our spirit man. Holy Spirit, we thank you right now. We thank you. Let the seed of your word go deep down into our heart and our spirit to produce much fruit. God, I thank you that this word is an answer for every problem we don't even know that we have. It's an answer, God, for purpose. It's an answer for future. It's an answer for the relationship struggles we have and the vacuum in our lives. God, it's an answer for strategies and inventions and ideas. God, it's the answer for elevation and possession and promotion. I thank you, Father, right now for the pure hunger. Hear the cry of your people. Right now, I just want you to cry out to the Lord in this moment. Take a moment, express to Him your desire for hunger, for thirst. I can pray it over you, but it's so much more powerful coming from your spirit. Let your spirit speak. Your spirit is shut up too much. Let your spirit speak right now. Just ask the Holy Spirit, God, give me a hunger for your word. Father, baptize me. I want to be thirsty. I want to have that urgency that I have when I'm so thirsty I can't stand it. Lord, give me that. I want that. God, we seek your face. We seek your kingdom. Nothing else that we seek matters. We push everything else to the side. God, we yearn for you. Remember this. You don't have to feel it to declare it. You don't have to feel it to say it and to do it. Act your way into a feeling right now. In this room and under the sound of my voice, I want you to just put up your hands if you wanna receive something from God. If you'd receive a gift, you don't just stand there with your hands down, you put your arms out. God, give it to us. Give us the gift of knowledge, the gift of wisdom. The greatest thing you've ever done for us or will ever do, you've already done. You gave us Jesus. You gave us your word. Lord, we repent for not taking seriously the opportunity to read your word. God, we thank you for the advantages that will come from studying scripture. And we commit anew to make time and intentionality to draw ourselves. Holiness means to set apart, to set ourselves apart for your purpose. God, we thank you right now. We're gonna commit tomorrow, 10 minutes of our day, 10 minutes to set aside and meditate on one verse. God, if you wanna commit that right now with me, 10 minutes, can you do it? Can you do 10 minutes and see what the Word of God will do? The Word of God does not return void. The Bible said, but it's, it, it accomplishes exactly what it was sent to do. Just like the rain falls to the earth and returns to the heavens, so the Word of God will return to God, not void, but accomplishing everything He sent it to do. The Holy Spirit is here right now. God, we thank you. God, we thank you. We know that we aren't gonna make it by hearing your word one day out of the week. This has to be a seven day commitment and devotion. Father, I thank you right now that you are, you are gaining permission, Holy Spirit to access our schedule. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you're going home with us to convict us of all the times throughout the day that we 
We feel bored for a second and we pick up our phone and start going through apps when we could be meditating on something you're saying to us. Bring conviction to us, Father. If we're your children, we wanna follow you and we can't follow you if we can't hear you. We humble ourselves before you under your mighty hand. We turn from our wicked ways. God, heal our land. We wanna hear your voice. We want this temple to be dedicated to you. God, bring a conviction to your people, what we're letting in our eyes, what we're letting in our ears. Holy Spirit, put a guard over our mouth in the name of Jesus. Sunday morning is not about a performance. I do not care about any kind of awkward silences at all. If we don't give silence, we don't give room for the Holy Spirit to speak, the still small voice, the whisper. You're waiting for God to speak to you, but you're expecting him to interrupt all the other voices and shout over your schedule. Can you set aside some time to be quiet, to be still. Even driving in your car, turn everything off. Lean into the voice of the Holy Spirit. Pray without ceasing. You know what that means? That means keep your prayer life woven throughout your day. It's not something you do once and forget. Bring him into every conversation. Acknowledge him in all your ways. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your will. We thank you for your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. North Campus. I just believe there's going to be a revolution for loving the Word of God, but we have to intentionalize it. I don't, Covenant Church is not meant to be a church where the thing we say is, oh, we have great speakers. I, I don't want you to leave here and say, that was a great word. I want you to leave here and say, God said this to me. God spoke to me. You can hear him. And the more you, you come and the more you tuck in under the table and you receive and you hear his voice and you get to know him, the more then when you open this, you understand. This is the sound, I get it, okay. This is the sound, I hear him. You're gonna learn a lot in the coming weeks. That's guaranteed, because the Word of God is gonna go forth. I wanna do something before we close this morning. With every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're in this room and you wanna know God, but you've never made the decision to give Him your life and to receive His life, His resurrection life, through the act of salvation, and this moment is for you. If you wanna pray a prayer with us, we're gonna pray it all together. I'm just gonna ask you to raise your hand all across this room. I see that hand. Yes, I see those hands. Yes, I see the hands in the back. I see the hands in the balcony. Yes, I see that hand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. One more, there's one more. This is for you. Yes, I see that hand. All of heaven is celebrating right now. Pray this prayer with me. Let's let it ring out together. Father God, I thank you for sending your son, Jesus, as a sacrifice for my sins. I believe that he lived, that he died, and that he rose again on the third day to give me new life. Jesus, come into my life and make me new. From this day forward, I'll follow you. I receive you now. And with these words, I believe I am saved. Amen. Let's celebrate. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. I want to do something again before we close right now. Anybody battling anything in their body right now? Raise your hand across this room. Anybody fighting anything physical? any illnesses right now. The Holy Spirit is here, and He's not just here 
to, to do whatever it is we ask Him to when we're intentional, but He is here. And when He's here, we want to ask Him for all the things. Holy Spirit, we ask right now for a healing touch. Jesus, we know that you suffered and that you died. You took the pain and the suffering of disease so that we could live a life more abundant. You even declared when you worked miracles that greater things we would see. This is the day and the hour for those words to be fulfilled in our midst. And we ask for miraculous signs and wonders and healing right now in Jesus' name. We thank you that cancer is disappearing, that diabetes is reversing right now in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father, that every illness, mental illness right now is being brought into alignment and authority under the Most High God. We thank you, Father, right now for every autoimmune disease. God, that our immune system began to work as it should. God, we thank you for open eyes. We thank you for vision that's restored. God, I thank you for hearing that's restored right now. I thank you for mobility in Jesus' name. God, I thank you right now for people that have digestion, internal issues that are creating a lot of problems in their life. Right now, God, I thank you that you're going to the root of that and you're healing in Jesus' name. You have full permission, God. Come in and do what only you can do. We thank you for complete healing in Jesus' name. We believe it and we receive it and now we celebrate it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I'm telling you guys, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm walking around with the stage four cancer diagnosis and I don't feel it, I don't think about it, I don't have pain, I don't worry about it. And that's not on me, that's a miracle. But you can have that. And what I encourage you to do is it's everything that I'm walking out right now is connected to the fact that I look my spirit in the eye every morning and I'm more concerned about the health of my spirit than I am about my physical body. If I take care of my spirit, the rest is gonna follow. So I encourage you to do that. Those gut issues, those anxiety issues are all connected. It's time for you to cast your cares on Him for He cares for you. Can I bless you as we go today? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May He make His face shine upon you. May He lift His countenance upon you and give you peace. And may He cover you with His name. Jesus, good day. God bless you.